My name is Kyle Rand, and I beat the often path by taking cutting edge technology and showing just how impactful it can be for the aging population. Welcome back to the Beat the Often Path podcast. I'm your host, Ross Palmer. On this show, we showcase unusual success stories to help us think about our lives and our careers. From a different perspective, if you like the show, please do me the favor of going ahead and hitting that subscribe button or rating the show five stars. Help build this community. Today, we've got Kyle Rand in the house, and he's the co-founder and CEO of Rendever. He grew up volunteering at a senior living community and later went on to study cognitive decline in the aging population at Duke University. Now, Kyle was recently named to Forbes 30 Under 30, and his company was just listed the Times list of the 100 most influential companies in 2022. Outstanding achievements, both. When you meet him, you'll understand why. His company has raised millions in funding, pursuing a truly noble cause, empowering the elderly to form communities through virtual reality. In case you didn't know, loneliness and isolation are two of the biggest problems facing us as we age, and he's found a life and career of meaning solving that challenge. Here is Kyle Rand, co-founder and CEO of Rendever. Thank you, Kyle, for joining me. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. How's it going today? It is great, Ross. I'm pleased to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm very pleased to have you because you tackle a few things that we're really interested in. Obviously, you're pushing the boundaries with technology, which is always cool, just thinking about the future in general. But part of that, some of the less sexy parts of the future, dealing with the aging population. These are things that a lot of people don't want to talk about. We know that it's a huge market because the population is aging. All of those boomers that TikTok keeps talking about, they're approaching retirement and old age. So there's about to be a huge explosion of this population. Um, But I do have to say before we jump in, there's one little issue that I have, and that is that because you're in VR, you're in the wrong thing. So Mm -hmm. VR was a few years ago. Now it's all about NFTs and crypto. So I don't know why we're even doing this. (laughs) I mean, that's a valid point like two weeks ago, but even what's changed in the past two weeks, like who knows? I think Coinbase stock just like took a massive tumble this week. It really did. I don't follow it that closely, I must admit, Ah. but... VR, at least for this demographic, is on the up and up and up. Right. And that would fit the stereotype that only old people will be using. I'm just kidding. All right. Let's get back on on track. Now, tell us about what you do and your mission and uh, how you came about getting on that mission. Yeah. So at Rendever, as a company, we are uh, on a mission to reduce social isolation through the power of positive shared experiences. And the primary way we do that is through virtual reality. Um, why we're doing this, there, there's a million reasons. But on a personal note, you know, I've had the pleasure of really spending my entire life working in some capacity with older adults. I used to volunteer at a senior living community. I studied cognitive decline in the aging population while I was at Duke. Um, I had some really, really unfortunately negative experiences with my grandmother as she was going through this process. And I got to see firsthand just how tough it can be, not only for an individual, but really for an entire family. And you know, seeing our family dynamics shift through that process was something that will always, always stick with me. And you know, fast forward a few years, I, I met up with a group of people who had similar experiences, and we kind of dug into the data behind social isolation. Now, that was be- that was before social isolation was something that we all experienced, right? We just spent two years getting a firsthand look into what exactly happens when you have an entire an entire life, an entire world ahead of you, and then all of a sudden, bam, doors Nothing. closed. Deal with it, right? We 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 all have that, and so I think my my job. If, as far as explaining just how bad social isolation can be is so much easier. Uh, I don't, yeah. you know, silver lining, also really negative. Um, but when you look at this demographic specifically, you know, it's, it's really dangerous. It's, we're talking about a 30% increase in risk of hypertension and stroke, a 50% increase in risk of dementia, a lot of premature cognitive decline. We're talking about immunosuppression, so risk of infection goes up. Uh, we're talking about even an increase in risk of diabetes. That one always floors me. And then the things you probably commonly easily think about is depression, anxiety, risk of suicide, all of these things together create a picture in which people are 30% higher mortality rates when they're uh, at a significant rate of social isolation. So, yep. And, and we've also noticed that it, uh, there's a 30% increase in the chances that they will start their own podcast. <laughs> at least. At least. Could at be least. 70% on that front. But terrible things, obviously. Horrible Mm -hmm. things. Um, I want to get into the personal element before we jump into all of that, because obviously that's huge. But on a personal level, I think 
anybody who's gotten older has dealt with the passing of a loved one. Anybody who has been a part of that system has witnessed it. I know I have. I know I've seen things with my own grandparents that were very frustrating, even down to the quality of food, the way that they're handled, just a lot of things that you think, hey, this isn't, this isn't so great. So what was it about the experience that first got you thinking, this is something that I want to be a part of, that I want to solve and not just complain about? You know, and, and, uh, there, there are a lot of negative things I could bring to the picture, but I honestly, the, the very first moment that always stuck with me was while I was volunteering at a community as a kid, there's this one day where uh, what I would do as a volunteer, we would go in and we'd scoop ice cream. It had an in-house ice cream parlor. So we were a bunch of kids that got really excited about being able to go in and scoop ice cream and eat as much ice cream as we wanted. And there was this one day where this gentleman walked in and I immediately, I locked eyes with him and I pointed at him and I said, you want rum raisin with chocolate sprinkles. And the smile that spread across his face from that little moment of recognition is something that just has stuck with me uh, through this day. And I think it really paints a picture of just how ripe for impact this population is, right? It's, 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 as you said, it's massive, massive and growing demographic. And it's people who've lived years and years of really incredible lives. And everybody, they're looking for a connection. And the opportunity to provide connection and provide means and pathways to form connections, it's a really easy mission to wake up excited about every single day. Absolutely. And why do you think it is that in our culture, we devalue the elderly? so much why are we so youth focused in general the only people have value are people who are under the age of 18. when did that happen and why you know i'll 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 answer my thoughts on the society part but i think the one of the big issues for industry is there's so much marketing material marketing budget ad spend that goes right towards the younger demographic what people are ignoring is that the 50 plus economy represents i think it's over eight trillion dollars and wow. to just totally ignore that much money is it makes no sense at, from a business perspective right? right and so there's a there's an entire conversation there there's a lot of people who are helping to understand what this longevity economy really is and it's massive it's massive and so i think we'll see a lot of people businesses taking shape and looking in this direction but i think there's a bigger underlying thing that you, you mentioned a second ago which is as a society we don't have a healthy relationship with aging Right? No. We, we think about aging, we think about old people, we think about death and we, we push it away. Right? It's, it's not something that we want to we lean into and talk about or think about, but it's so odd because the two things that are guaranteed in our life is that we're getting older second by second and at some point we're going to die. Yep. And so yep. we don't have the capacity to think about it, to, to have conversations about it, to ideate and think about how can we make that process better, knowing that that's a process we're all going to go through, then, then we're not only selling the current demographic short, we're also selling ourselves short. Mm -hmm. That's so true. And so many businesses, of course, I live in the greater Los Angeles area, and you won't go broke making a business that offers facial fillers, Botox, uplifts, anything to make us look younger, hair implants. I don't know if you've seen these photos floating around, but it's, it's not just the Kardashians, but it's anybody like them. It's here's what they posted on Instagram and here's what they actually looked before it was so heavily edited, photoshopped, all of that. The difference is night and day. The real image is a very obviously aging person with all of the defects that come with aging. And what is presented on Instagram is essentially more of a painting than it is a photograph. But that's the world where we all feel like we have to present this youthful image at all times. And I've always taken issue with that. I've always felt that aging doesn't have to be something that we have to fight. It can be something that we can embrace, Mm -hmm. but we just, we don't. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my favorite trends that's uh, happening right now are people really starting to adopt and lean into gray hair and silver hair. And people are stunning with with that color hair. I agree. It it can look so good. Richard Gere proved that years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I think men before women, but now women are really like increasingly starting to lean yeah. into it. And it's just it's stunning. Um, but you're right. There's there's so much if you look to the younger demographic, if you look to the influence that social media has, there's so much focus on having a picture of perfect face, which is often thought of as youthful, which is often thought of as uh perfect, which is just it's it's not right. Yeah, and, and contrary, I if I'm not mistaken, I believe in Eastern cultures, they believe 
that the elderly have wisdom and that they have things that they can impart on the younger generation. But we seem to have this opposite thing where anything an older person says is automatically devalued. People think if I don't look a certain way, then nobody's going to listen to what I have to say. They just won't even won't even listen at all. And on platforms like TikTok, like you said, social media, we've noticed that absolutely, where if you're not a kid posting on TikTok, you're a dinosaur. You're nobody. There's nothing that you I'm can do. I'm a dinosaur. Know. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, dinosaur. a dinosaur too. I got called a boomer. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm part of like, to call, that is the greatest insult you can give our generation. <laughs> with all the stuff that we've had to deal with to, to lump us into that generation, that's crazy. But the millennial mm -hmm. generation gets kind of just conveniently lumped in when it makes sense. That's nuts, though. We don't no, share those life uh, stories. Not at all. It's, it's so interesting. Like, if you think about social media, a lot of what social media has the power to do is to connect people and to help right. form, like, connections across, across massive boundaries. And on the flip side, what really is happening is it feels like it's creating these microcultures that you're either a part of or you're not. And it creates this like us versus them mentality that but there's, there's a lot of people who could probably speak a lot more uh, fine tuned about that whole topic. But I think one of the, to, to tune it a little bit towards where we are, one of the things that I noticed early on was even like when I was talking to my parents, right? I remember, I remember as a college student, always calling my parents old, and always thinking they were the oldest. And now I work in the aging demographic. My parents are in their early 60s. And they're now saying, oh, we're so old. I'm like, you you have no idea. You're so young. You have so much right. opportunity, so much life. <laughs> like, yeah. like, go out there and explore. And I think that one of the things that really, having reflected on this a ton, uh, really creates these situations in which it's easy to call somebody old is when technology comes into play. Right? Yeah. Someone is introduced to technology and they don't get it. They get frustrated by it. They're like, nah, that's not for me. And that creates like an immediate divide between people who are tech adaptive and people who want to push away tech because it frustrates them. And that's such, it's so unfortunate. And it's been really formative in how we've built this company and saying, you know, tech doesn't have to be something that divides and creates like an us versus them, um, but actually can allow people to, to connect if it's approached in the right way. So true. Do you feel that there's a component of, not feeling that they're allowed to embrace tech because um, my mom, I was talking to her. We have my brother and his kids live in Seattle. My mom is in Colorado. And I said, why don't you get a Nintendo Switch? That way you can play Mario Kart with uh, with my nephew. She's she like, thinks, no, I want oh, VR instead. I can't do that. Well, we're going to get into that now. <laughs> but it's, she, oh, I can't do that. Nintendo Switch is for kids. It's like, is it though? Does it have to be? Couldn't it just be fun, a way to connect? Um, so that brings us back to how do you give, what kind of handholding do you need to have to give these people the permission for one thing? Say, yes, it's okay to put on this VR headset. And also, I assume the training or uh, the information that they need to use it that's where you come in? Is that a personal thing? You have to have somebody physically there saying this is how it works and let me help you with that? Yeah, yeah. Be before we dive in, first of all, marketers like take note, huge demographic, huge industry, huge spending power. If only the Nintendo Switch was marketed at this demographic. Imagine what would happen. And you know, what's interesting, like Facebook's portal devices, I think in the very, like right from day one, they were really targeting intergenerational connection through technology. And that to me was such a big breath of fresh air. And That's I think that, again, we're, we're going to see a lot more of that start to take shape. Um, and then to take one step further into, um, you know, how you need to approach that, I think, and, and why the divide I think happens right now is for a lot of people, technology presents an opportunity for escape. This is, a, this is definitely true with the Nintendo Switch and video gaming. It's definitely true in, in a lot of VR circles. Um, it's true in social media circles, right? It creates an opportunity to escape. And it's like, you, you think about the word escape. What do, you, what do you think? The last the last thing you think about is, oh, I need to teach someone how to navigate this technology, More right? That, that's effort. That can be, it can be stressful having to, you know, the, it, naturally, it, it can be stressful as a young person trying to like identify and understand and navigate like, okay, you don't understand, you're not grasping this because you don't have these years of experience. So we got to take like six giant steps back to say, before we can take even one step forward, right? And I think that that creates a lot of friction. It creates, an, it, it, it creates this 
dynamic where rather than technology naturally being an opportunity to connect, people kind of push and therefore older adults might say, oh, like this is actually a disconnection device and I need, I need to maybe steer clear of it. Yeah. So true. And so you built this, you said six years, a lot of crazy stuff has happened, but then some accolades, some very big accolades start rolling in. Forbes 30 under 30, huge. Congratulations on that. Um, you have also been recognized. Was it in, in Time Magazine? 100, was it most influential companies? Some this accolade? Year. This year, 2022. Yeah. My God. So how are these people finding you? Do you reach out or your the word had just spread? Yeah, that 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 time one still is a is a big smile. What's what's crazy? That's wild. It, came, it came on the the heels of in 2021, we launched a couple, we well, we launched one really new platform called Rendever Live, which uh, allowed us to do live programming through VR, in which we were like distributing our programming to communities in a, in a really centralized, really cool, really unique way. And, and it's like this whole new approach to community building, which I could talk about also for hours. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was honored by Time's uh, 100 Best Inventions list. We, we, we were listed as an honoree um, in 2021. Wow. And yeah, it's just it's th those accolades, like their external validation, that, that there's a limit to, to, to what you can get from it. But like there's, as a company, again, since we don't have the external pressure and since everything is so internal, um, what, what we've built is a company that is really high on gratitude. One of my favorite parts about our company is that we kickstart every single all hands meeting with a kudos session where everybody just gives kudos to everybody. I think the, the last meeting last week, it lasted a full 25 minutes. In an hour and a half long meeting, 25 minutes was people just delivering Insane. kudos to each other and like expressing gratitude. And, and that's really unique. And so we had that so, so well built internal, but you can't deny how amazing it feels to get some of that external validation into uh, for that time, 100 most influential companies list, like the companies that we were there with, right? I Apple. Mean, that's crazy. Yeah. That's there, huge. It was, it was amazing. I think also, you know, if we're going to take a, a step back to, earlier parts of the conversations, hopefully also it's, it's, it's an important step in showing that age tech is serious. Age tech is important. Age tech is, is starting to really enter the market and go beyond like the niche idea of senior living and um, which isn't, which isn't niche. That's not the right word, but you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's been kind of separate because Wait, we compartmentalize it and Very deliberately. Good. That's so. the right word. Thank you. Well, Thank you, you might say we just kick them to the curb. It's inconvenient. All right, grandma, get out of here. Somebody else is going to take care of you now in an assisted living facility. Some, some, sure. Not, um, not my problem anymore. Yeah. Sure, 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 sure. We, we, we could, we, we could go deep on that too, but yeah, it, it's definitely compartmentalized. And you know, to be able to step out with such a big accolade and have, have like a, a big moment for the overall age tech industry and in, in getting that recognition and getting, getting that the, those eyeballs is just. I'm excited about it. I think I think we're about to see a lot of things shift in the age tech industry, and it's great to be at the forefront of it. When we think about historically, let's say the last few decades of senior care, senior living, mm -hmm. when you think of what community means in those often dismal environments, mm -hmm. and I was there in the final moments of my wife's uh, grandmother's life, and she hated it. She hated every minute. She was stuck with a bunch of people who were cognitively below her. She was very limited and she felt very frustrated because she retained most of her cognitive abilities until the very end. And she was 98 years old. She was a heck of a woman. Insane. But she was very frustrated because she felt, oh, nobody, I can't connect with any of the people around me. And there quite frankly weren't that many people around her, just a, a dozen or two perhaps in, in her little wing. When we think about senior care historically, we think about somebody wheeling out a small TV on a cart, them gathering and communal time is looking at a TV, watching days of our lives, and one person wants to watch it and the other 10 don't. <laughs> and they're waiting for their turn, so to speak. So the kind of activities that have historically been available just haven't been very good. What does community look like now with your solution for them? Yeah. You know, stereotypes are so tough. That stereotype, hearing that just like, oh, hurt, hurt my soul. But you're right. That is what a lot of people think about when they think about this industry. Yeah. And um, 
I have to say the industry has changed so much. Great. Like if you look at 60, even six years ago when we, when we got started versus today, like every single person, every single member of this industry, I think it's, it's really unique in that everybody cares, right? Like you don't end up in this industry by accident. You do it because there's something that pulls your heart towards taking care of our, our, our older uh, society members. And that makes it a really beautiful industry to work in. I think that unfortunately up until recently, uh, the lack of innovation in the space, the lack of people who had the capacity to build such amazing things, turning and saying, how can we make, the aging process better meant that no matter how much heart you had, it was so easy to burn out and it was so easy to, to struggle. And it was so easy to get stuck in days of our lives. Right. And um, today that's so different. Right. And, and that's very much due to companies like us and other companies who are starting to innovate in this space where we're using all the amazing things that are happening in the world of technology and saying, let's, let's figure out how to apply it to this demographic change, change people's lives. And with more and more people turning this way, I think that what, what kind of is unspoken, but really, really truly felt about across the industry is that it's, it's a lot of teamwork happening, right? Like, and, and that's, I said it just a little bit ago, like our approach is really partnership based. It's relationship based. It's every single community partner that we work with. We're not just like selling them hardware. They don't go on and like check out on a cart and just start using Rendever, right? We are in constant contact with them to make sure that we're understanding how they're using it, make sure we see like, oh, that's an opportunity that you might not think about, try that. And it means that we really get to augment the on the ground work through our technology, but also through uh, the relationships that we have with each individual and the relationships we have across the entire community of senior living, because we learn something from everybody. Then we get to boil that into a better approach that we then mm. send to everybody. And then those staff members then get to use that approach and create these magical moments, which you, you get someone to lighten up and come alive in VR and connect and have a deep conversation. And like that just, it just fills your cup right up. Do you do anything with music? I wonder, because obviously music therapy is a hot topic right now. Great, for great question. And music therapy, unfortunately, the number of music therapists that are licensed is it's dismally low. I think a few still, years huh? ago, still, yeah, a few years ago, I remember uh, I was I was visiting a community and they had a music therapist, and it turned out that she was the only licensed music therapist in the state of Rhode Island. No one, way, one and only. In, in one <laughs> oh, of the Hopefully that shifted a little bit, but there's yeah. obviously opportunity there. And, and yeah. uh, there, there, there are some cool companies that are looking and seeing how we can do this. Well, there, there's a company called SameFit that is actually based in, in LA um, that's looking at broadening access to music therapy. And as far as what we're doing with music, uh, so, some of our most exciting moments have been through music-based experiences. You know, there is, there's one, we work with healthcare systems too in, in our uh longest standing, biggest healthcare system, UC Health. They're amazing. They have a really big focus on patient experience. Uh, they work all throughout the state of Colorado and they had a stage four pancreatic cancer patient who uh, like spent her whole life involved in music. And we got a call being like, we need to, we need to figure out how to, how to bring her something unique. And so we partnered with uh, the Colorado Symphony and went on stage at Red Rocks Amphitheater filmed the entire symphony experience during sunset at Red Rocks oh, and then brought man. this patient as the first person to get to experience it. And it was unforgettable. And, you know, at one point she said, music has always been my medicine. And one of the hardest parts about navigating this journey is, you know, her, her access to being able to experience live music is just totally cut. And to be able to put on a headset and all of a sudden be on stage at one of the most beautiful, natural... One of the things. most spectacular music venues in the entire world. With an amazing symphony of the Colorado Symphony. It was just, it was incredible. That's so great. And you get to decide, you get to choose, and you get feedback. Somebody says, I'm looking for this kind of experience. And you say, okay, let's yeah. make it happen. We can do yeah. that. And that's, that, that's our approach, right? It's, it's We're looking for what people want. You know, in the, in the early days, we were thinking, you know, we can we're gonna do a lot of nature experience, a lot of animal experiences. We totally have puppy experiences on the platform. And those, those deliver really, really well. But we were totally limited in the beginning. And now we understand if there's 
an opportunity to impact one individual at one community with an experience, the life that comes to that one individual and the relationship they build that staff member by nature of social dynamics, right? That spills out to every other member of the community. And so our approach to experience building is just, it's widespread uh, and, and it's paid off in such incredible ways. That's incredible. And I'm sure that the staff appreciate having more tools at their disposal yeah. so that they get to feel more fulfilled in their work. Obviously, the people who are using it get to feel more fulfilled. Have you gotten any insight? I know it may be early as far as statistics are concerned, but at the beginning, we talked about all these horrible statistics of loneliness and social isolation. We know that humans are social creatures. We know that loneliness is bad and even kills. Have you seen any positive progress? Is there anything you can point to where you can say these outcomes are getting reduced through this kind of technology? Totally, totally. And, you know, back to what I said before, in 2016, VR wasn't ready. We had to do market education. Back then, when we said we could use VR to positively impact the lives of older adults, there were a lot of people who reacted in some pretty funny ways. And so we knew one of the first things we had to do was not, not just demonstrate, not just show people what it looked like, but we also had to do some research. So one of the first things we did was we did a study with uh, MIT Age Lab. Joe Coughlin is one of the biggest influences in the aging industry and the longevity economy. And uh, Benchmark Senior Living is one of the biggest operators here in New England where we're based. And you know, as, as a company, we, we've really built this platform. We've built everything on, on this, this idea that the foundation of human connection is positive shared experience. And what we're doing through our platform is we're enabling people to get these experiences and through that form connections. And I think at this point, hopefully everybody listening, like Ken kind of understands what that is. Uh, but back then it was like, what, what, what does that even mean? And so we set out to, to, to say, we, we can do this. And what we found is that for just two weeks of daily shared experiences in Randever, uh, participants had statistically significant decreases in their depression scores and increases in multiple measures of social health. Most interestingly, people actually started to trust each other more. So what? when we think about what it means to build a relationship, right? One of the fundamental elements is trust, right? You need the capacity to trust someone if you're gonna build a relationship with them. And to see that positively be influenced through just two weeks of experiences points to, you know, this isn't just people having fun together using technology. This is people who are presented with a unique opportunity to really authentically, genuinely connect and they're taking it and they're running with it. I mean, what more can you say than that? That's truly fabulous. And I'm so glad that you have made it your life's work to commit to this. And I really look forward to hearing what kinds of innovations and what kind of new statistics you can bring about in the next decade. It seems like the possibilities are truly limitless. Truly, truly. Through the technology and also through all the heart that's in this industry, there's there's so much that we can do. And we, ha we have an active clinical trial going, so we'll have more data to share. And uh, it really feels like we are just at the beginning of what's possible. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, I'm, I'm floored. I'm blown away by everything you've said, by your intelligence, your stick to your commitment to a cause greater than yourself. These are all of the things that I personally value the most in society and in individuals. I'm very glad to have made your acquaintance today. I, I couldn't support what you're doing anymore, just, just period. I think it's awesome. Um, I, I do want to end with one little quick question that I often do. Again, we talk about unusual success stories. What would you say is the most counterintuitive or unusual piece of advice or something that goes against the grain of what people normally are taught or believe that you believe 100%? Hmm. I, it's a great question. I'm going to use the word grain. Um, the, as an early entrepreneur, everybody wanted to give advice. And the advice to everybody is, you know, you're not the first person to do something. Go out there, figure out who did what, like, what, what can you learn from everybody? And while there's truth to that, I think the thing that I really stuck to as an early entrepreneur was, Everyone has advice, but that advice is 100% informed on their by their personal experiences. And if you take somebody's advice without actively figuring out how big of a grain of salt you need to put on that piece of advice, you're going to be sent in every single which way direction. And there is so much power. And if you're fully confident in what you're doing and the approach you have and your why, 
then take as much advice as you can, but understand that you need to be adding grains of salt to all of it. That's that's great. Very sobering and wise message for sure. So before I give you the floor to wrap up this episode, another thing on a practical note, somebody out there who has people who are in the system right now, relatives, younger generation, people have grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, father, mother, anybody in the system, what advice would you have? have to them, let's say that they're experiencing something that they're disappointed with, what would you say that they could do to make some steps to improve the quality of life for their relatives or loved ones? That's a great question. I think um, that the easiest one to say is to have, is to reach out to me and like, uh, let's see, let's get, let's get <laughs> some call it alley oop in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> let's get some Rendever going. Um, so I will say on that note, rendever.com, come reach out. Uh, we are always excited to expand our community of partners and uh, we're, we're, we're here to serve the industry and make the industry better. So please do reach out. Uh, but uh, on an individual basis in ways that you can be better, um, it, I think one of the things that is tough to navigate is caregiver guilt and ca- caregiver burden, right? You experience these things hand in hand, right? As as your duties as a caregiver go up, whether or not you're alone, you have help with home care, you have a loved one in senior living, you're still a caregiver, right? By, by definition, the relationship. And as those duties go up, the burden goes up and your emotional response, right? Can be a little bit more wide ranging, which creates opportunity for caregiver guilt to set in. And I think the one thing that I would encourage everybody who's in the middle of that process would be to, you know, remember that it's a relationship that you're a part of and it's really easy to get wrapped up in the caregiving side of the relationship, but there is another element to that relationship and figure out how to set up time, space, opportunities to be a part of the relationship as it exists outside of your caregiver duties. And that makes everything better. It will make everything better. And then ways to help that, use technology, use you like create an experience, do, do something that that creates a conversation that's easy to lean into. That's not about medication. It's not about diet. It's not about you know how you're feeling. It's 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 about something else. Well, both sides, both sides will be better for it. I think that's a fabulous way to wrap up our discussion. Again, thank you so much for your time, Kyle. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm so jazzed about what you're doing, and I look forward to following your progress from afar and and cheering you on and. I wish you a great time when you come out here. I hope you enjoy yourself in this neck of the woods, and I hope we can stay in touch. So I really, really appreciate you coming on, Kyle. Thanks, Ross. It was really, really, really great to be here. I really loved the conversation. My pleasure. And with that, the podcast is officially over. Mm-hmm.